Right. Uh, welcome to another session with the Prod folks. Uh, good evening to the ones who joined us from India and good morning to the ones from the States. Happy Father's Day to all. Uh, so uh, just quickly briefing you guys about the agenda today. Uh, we'll have like a very quick intro about the community, the product folks, and uh, something about the speaker profile. Then we'll have roughly 35 minutes of content from Shreyas. And post that we'll be moving to something around 20 to 25 minutes of Q&A. Uh, we're going to tell you about the Q&A process in a while. Meanwhile, uh, coming to the community, so uh, I am Parth and I represent the product folks. Product folks is a volunteer driven community of product managers and enthusiasts. Uh, we're trying to make something, uh, gr uh, we're trying to grow in the product space together. And uh, we have a bunch of offerings, uh, offerings ranging from uh, content curated uh, with learnpm.me. We have an APM bootcamp, which is called insurgio.club. You guys can check that out. And lastly, we e-connect professionals together uh, via a, a web link called grabchai.online. You should definitely check that out. Uh, apart from this, we do a lot of bunch of stuff there and you should definitely check our Twitter and LinkedIn for that, for the latest updates. Uh, coming to the speaker profile, uh, Suhas. Thanks so much, Parth. And uh, you guys can hear me all right, right? All right, awesome. Um, firstly, hi Shreyas, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we're super excited to host you. And um, for everyone who hasn't uh, stalked him on LinkedIn already or hasn't followed him on Twitter yet, please go follow him because I think uh, he's probably one of the most popular product uh, you know, um, uh, folks in the product management space on Twitter today and shares a tons of learnings from his experience and more on that that we learn today. Uh, he's currently a PM lead with Stripe, but has had experiences across uh, Yahoo, Twitter um, over, over the 15 years that he's been in the Silicon Valley. And um, today, uh, the session that we have with him is on his journey uh, over um, these 15 years. Uh, one particular thread that was on good PM, good PM and great PM is something that um, uh, we really loved. And I think Shreyas is going to go deeper into that during this uh, particular uh, session. So with that intro, I think um, over to you, Shreyas, and we are super excited to hear more about this. Thanks, Suhas. Thanks, Parth. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. I know that you've all dialed in from uh, all parts of the world, uh, and I'm thrilled to be here with all of you today uh, to share some lessons I've learned about product management uh, during my career in Silicon Valley. Uh, and to begin with, uh, here's a map of my career journey as a PM. Um, and you see a number of companies uh, where I worked as a PM. And it, each of these companies, I've had the chance to manage some of their most important products and initiatives. Right from Yahoo, where I was uh, the product manager for what later became OAuth, uh, to Google, where I learned about the tremendous leverage with working with uh, scale products, to Twitter, where I was responsible for user safety, among other things, which was and still is one of the biggest problems for the platform. Uh, to Stripe, where I led uh, one of their most significant products, Connect, uh, since its early days, uh, and also helped establish the PM function at Stripe in the early days. Now, uh, unlike some of my recent talks, this session is more for aspiring and early mid-career PMs uh, than for PM leaders. Uh, that said, if you are a PM leader, you will likely find the content and the frameworks here, uh, which you can perhaps apply to your job and for mentoring PMs on your team. Uh, and we'll cover three parts today. Uh, first is being suitable for the PM job. Second is becoming great at the PM job. Uh, and then uh, the last one is picking the right places to do the job. And all along, I'll share some stories from my own career, plus some frameworks uh, that you can use in your own journey. Uh, and look, each of us is different. And my perspective has been formed through 15 years exclusively in Silicon Valley. And clearly not everything here will work for everyone everywhere in the world. 
But what you're about to see has worked quite well for me uh, and for the people I've mentored over the years. So to begin with uh, being suitable for the job. For almost as long as I've been a PM, I've received messages from aspiring PMs asking these types of questions about getting into product management. Uh, in fact, I used to get these questions so frequently that uh, in 2010, uh, I did a one hour talk dedicated to this topic. You can still find the slides from that talk online, but I'd say you don't need to because my advice can be boiled down to these three things. The first is do the PM role before you get the PM title. The second is the best place to start doing the PM role is your current company. Uh, and the third is side projects are your ticket to being considered seriously in PM interviews. Now on number one, I've found that people typically wait to get the PM job before starting to do the PM role. And I think that's a mistake. On number two, it's much harder to transition to product management work and change companies at the same time. So it's better to do one transition at a time instead of trying to do two transitions, which is why I say you should just try to do the PM job at the, your current company. Uh, and number three is hardest for people in my experience. And so after seeing this, some PMs go or some aspiring PMs go, but I don't have ideas for the product to work on uh, at my job, or I'm not an engineer. I don't know engineers, uh, or I do know engineers, but they're too busy and won't get convinced to work on side projects. And so that's when I say, aha, that is a test of your PM suitability. You need to recognize that the problem of breaking into product management with no experience is not different from actual problems that you'll be expected to solve when you do become a product manager. So as tempting as it might be uh, to just first get the job and figure out the rest later, you should know that if you can't figure this out or don't want to invest the energy to figure this out, that says a lot about your likelihood of success if you do become a PM. And same for getting an MBA. Uh, there can be a lot of value in getting that MBA uh, but it'll merely get you an interview for an entry-level PM job. It isn't going to do much to make you successful on the job. So again, uh, do the role before you get the job. Now, it's story time. Let me tell you about my own story of getting into product management as an engineer with no prior experience and no MBA. Uh, and for that, we have to rewind back 15 years to 2005. Uh, back then, I was at EDS. For those of you who aren't familiar with EDS, uh, it was a massive technology services and infrastructure company. And I worked out of their Silicon Valley office, uh, uh, which was actually a company they had acquired called LoudCloud. We were building a novel data center automation solution at the time. And that's when I got interested in product management. As an engineer, I would talk to our internal customers and then share ideas for product features with my product manager, Dan, at the time. And he was quite receptive to those ideas. And once we had decided what to build, I would just go ahead and build it. Now, over time, as Dan got busier with other work, uh, I took on more and more of the PM role. And around that time, I started getting serious about pursuing product management as a career. Why did I want to pursue product management? Well, there were a number of reasons for it, but two are most salient. One, I found myself much more in a state of flow when I was doing product management work. Second, I was a good engineer, but I had realized by then that I was never going to be a great engineer. So I was top 20% perhaps as an engineer, but I knew I could have never been top 5%. So I wanted to take a chance on a career where I could be in the top 5% and I felt like product management might be it. So my next challenge was uh, how to get into product management. And at the time I talked to a couple of accomplished product managers and rapidly concluded that doing an MBA wasn't for me. 
So then I made a six to nine month plan uh, to become suitable for a PM role at a product company. Now, those were totally different days. At the time, there was one class on product management in the Valley. Um, so I took that class mainly to learn about the product management vocabulary that I would need for uh, PM interviews. I also started a number of new projects within my team at EDS to learn product management on the job. And so that way I could talk about my PM experience in future interviews, even though I did not have the PM title just yet. Then it was time to start job hunting. Uh, and after a few months of sending my resume out, I was able to secure uh, interviews with Yahoo, which was still a pretty big force in the Valley at the time. Uh, and Google, uh, which was the up and comer after its successful IPO a few years before. And I went through the process with both companies and uh, guess what? Chose to join Yahoo. Now, if you're curious about why I chose Yahoo instead of Google at the time, we can cover that in the Q&A. Anyway, that was 2006 and that was my foot in the door uh, into product management. My first official PM role. And it's been an amazing ride ever since then. Um, so that's my story. Now, while everyone's circumstances are different, uh, I wanted to highlight the most important takeaway from my story and the story of almost every successful PM I have worked with. And that takeaway, once you internalize it, will not only help you get into product management, but it will also be pivotal in your success as a product manager. So what is it? Um, this is the most significant thing I'll say in my talk today. And it's the concept of high agency. It's about finding a way to get what you want without waiting for conditions to be perfect or otherwise blaming the circumstances. And I thought the best way to depict high agency is like this. You have Bob on the left-hand side. Bob is a low agency individual. When faced with a tough challenge, this is Bob's instinctive reaction. Bob says he wants to make progress, but other things are getting in his way. Mind you, these are real challenges. Bob isn't just imagining them. And they are tough challenges too. But what makes Bob a low agency individual is that he's willing to resign himself to the circumstances he's facing. So that's Bob, a low agency individual. Contrast Bob's approach with Alice, who's a high agency individual. And Alice takes a drastically different perspective. Notice how she takes a holistic point of view of what's important for the company. Uh, and then everything she says comes from a place of what she can control. Now I've worked with and managed and mentored hundreds of PMs during my career. And I can't tell you how many times I've come across an otherwise talented PM whose impact and career is being held back because that PM is like low agency Bob. Conversely, I've come across PMs who've done incredibly well in their career, despite not having fancy degrees from fancy universities, mainly because they are like high agency Alice. So that's high agency. Now, throughout my career, back to my story, uh, high agency has helped me make uh, the impact that many of my more intelligent and charismatic peers were not able to. For instance, when I started at Yahoo, uh, I was told that it was nearly impossible to build new features at Yahoo at the time uh, because the legal team and the security team had extremely strict requirements. Now, uh, once I took the job and I started talking to these teams, what I found is that their requirements actually made a lot of sense. I just had to explore creative ways to provide the user experience I wanted while making sure we were keeping our users safe, which is what our legal team and our security team wanted. So that's the right way to build products anyway. And uh, what I did is uh, instead of turning legal and security and other teams into adversaries, I was able to turn them into advocates. At Google, I was able to successfully make the case for a number of AdWords features that previous PMs were not able to. Again, there wasn't any magic here. It was just about truly understanding the trade-offs 
and giving other teams the confidence that I was thinking holistically, thinking like an owner of the company, not just driving my personal agenda. Same at Twitter, when I was working on one of the toughest issues they faced, user safety. And so that's why I, I listed high agency as one of the necessary traits for product managers when I did the unthinkable a couple of months ago and summarized product management in one tweet. Uh, George Mack has a nice Twitter thread on high agency and I thought this picture depicts high agency better than anything I've seen. Naturally then, the next question is, how does one cultivate high agency? And my first recommendation here would be to read the seven habits of highly effective people one more time. In it, Stephen Covey talks about the circle of uh, concern, things we care about and ought to pay attention to, and the circle of influence, things we can influence and change for the better. And high agency individuals always have a large circle of influence and are constantly trying to grow it. Whereas low agency individuals have a smaller circle of influence and they don't consciously make attempts to grow that circle. So really important circle of influence. Here's my own answer to the question of cultivating high agency. Here I've split high agency into the traits you need and the skills you need. Ownership mindset is perhaps the most important of the three traits. You also need self-confidence and resilience. In terms of skills, you need creative execution and you need influential communication. So if you want to become a high, higher agency individual, you need to work on these component skills and traits. I'll tell you, it won't be easy, but I promise you, it will be profoundly rewarding for you and for the people you work with. In my Twitter thread on good product managers, great product managers, you will see high agency as a common theme across many of the points I made in there. Now, speaking of great product management, we can move on to the second part of this talk, which is becoming great at the job. And in this part, I'll talk about how you become great at product management once you've gotten the role. And I'll start with two frameworks that I share with any new team member of mine. This is my go-to framework in conversations with any early career PM. Early on in your PM career, these are the three things you need to fixate on. I call them the three essential senses of a PM and they are execution sense, analytical sense, and product sense. And they should be quite self-evident, uh, but if you're curious, I've also written Twitter threads on this topic uh, and you can find a link in the chat section. I also want to share with you another framework that I share with uh, team members very early on in our relationship. On the left side, you see the base case of how a typical PM grows over time, uh, fairly linearly with time. Uh, and here I mean growth in terms of competence, uh, that is the acquisition of skills required to be a better PM, and not so much in terms of when is my next promotion happening. So it's really important it's about skills, it's about competence in the PM craft. So the left side is the base case uh, of, for a typical PM. Now, what I like to draw with my team members is the chart on the right and ask, what if you could increase the slope of that line so that you're growing much faster than the base case? And then I point out that if you did that, you'll be setting yourself up for a much more fulfilling and flourishing career as a PM. And of course, everyone answers, yes, that's exactly what I want. To which I reply, all right, let's create a program that's tailored for you. It's gonna require hard work on your part and is also gonna require you to think about your career growth in really unconventional ways. So with this, we've established a two-way contract on my commitment to their growth and their commitment to doing what it takes to grow. And this is the most powerful framework for growth um, 
which is the liability superpower framework. And it looks like this. Um, think about your relative competence for each of the essential senses of a PM. Remember, they are execution sense, analytical sense, and product sense. Now, early on in your career, one of these might be a strength and another one might be a major liability. So here's your strategy. You need to work on eliminating any liability, liabilities as soon as possible. You need to bring your below median sense at least up to the median. And you need to turn your biggest strength into a superpower. Now, to make this concrete, I'm going to share my liability super pl power plot uh, when I had just started out as a product manager at Yahoo. Now, at the time, uh, even though I was early on in my PM career, I was already quite strong on product sense. So that's why you see product sense high up there towards the right. But I was terrible at execution. That's the sense on the left. And so that was clearly a liability. And I was okay at analytical sense, but still well below the median. So I began by focusing on eliminating the execution liability at Yahoo. And then after Yahoo, getting to Google was great because uh, back then Google excelled at execution. And within two years of being at Google, my execution sense was well above the median. It still wasn't a superpower, but it was fairly good. And then similarly, around 2012, I wanted to get better with analytical sense because it was hovering around the median at the time. Uh, so what did I do? I decided to join the Google search ads team, uh, which was extremely analytical about its product decisions, about how to make decisions about what shows up on the Google search results page. Working in that environment, and with the people who knew a lot more about analytical product decisions than I did, really accelerated my growth there in the two years I worked in that area. And this came in very handy for me at Twitter, uh, which particularly valued product people with strong product sense and strong analytical sense. And so having placed myself outside of my comfort zone to exercise my analytical sense on Google search ads came in very handy for my success at Twitter. So that's my liability superpower plot. Now, taking on projects that force you to fix a liability is great, no doubt. The trouble here is that most PMs just do that. They choose only to learn from projects at work. And I think that's a mistake as well. And really ambitious PMs are especially susceptible to that mistake. They're ambitious, they're fixated on moving up, and the way they decide to channel all that ambition is to put all of their time and energy towards ongoing projects at work. And they don't leave time for any growth outside of those projects. So what do I recommend instead of doing that? It's this framework. Let's visualize this framework in terms of the time you have during a given week. So a week has 168 hours. Now, you will allocate a part of that chunk of time to your career. This includes everything you do for your job and your career growth. Now, let's say you've allocated 60 hours as career time uh, every week, and the remaining will be applied towards other parts of your life, like you also need to sleep, right? Uh, so as I mentioned, the default approach of very ambitious PMs is to spend all of this career time on projects at work. All of these 60 hours will be spent on ongoing projects at work. Here's the approach that I recommend instead. Here, we're still starting with 60 hours of career time. We haven't changed that because you do have a life outside of your career, but you're spending 80% of your time on projects at work. And you're spending the remaining 20% on focused study you're spending it on turning your liabilities into non-liabilities and your strengths into superpowers. And too often ambitious PMs find this counterintuitive. They ask me, well, if I do this Shreyas, won't it hurt my growth at work? And what I've found is quite the opposite. The 20% of time you spend on learning the craft increases the impact of the remaining 80% of your career time. It makes you more efficient and effective. 
So it's counterintuitive for sure, but spending less time on your work projects than you would normally will help you do a better job on those projects if you're spending the remaining time on focus study. Plus, you will differentiate yourself from the crowd because you'll be building entirely new skills for yourself and for your company. And note that this doesn't just apply to uh, early career PMs. It applies at all levels of product management. Let's take my own example uh, when I began leading larger product teams. Here's how I rated on product strategy, people management, and product editing about six years ago. And as you can see, I did, did not rate very highly uh, on these skills. Uh, and this was important for me to get right because each of these is an essential skill for product leaders. So when I was at Twitter, I set a goal for myself to become a top 20 product leader in Silicon Valley. This was around 2015. And that meant I had to improve in each of these three areas. Now, Fast forward to today on product strategy, I've gone from being slightly below the median to pretty confidently in the top 10%. And it's similar for people management and product editing, where I'm almost, almost near the bottom 10% not too long ago. And to this day, after 15 years of doing product management, I still spend about 20% of my time every week on things that just make me better at the craft. And that's why in my good PMs, great PMs thread, I wrote that good PMs const constantly learn the craft of product management through the projects they take on at work. Great PMs also learn through work projects, but they learn a lot more about their craft in their personal time because of their curiosity and passion for self-improvement. Now, as you execute on this skills building strategy, one of the main goals is to turn your strength into a superpower. That is really important. But I want to make you aware of a pitfall. You should know your strengths, you should leverage them, but do not label yourself publicly with your strengths. What do I mean by that? Uh, let's see some examples. Sometimes you'll find this in people's Twitter bio or LinkedIn bio. I'm a data-driven PM. I'm a problem solver. I'm a design-driven PM. I'm a customer-driven PM and so on. And the challenge here is that once you label yourself publicly, you're forced to be consistent with what you've been telling yourself and others about who you are. And that might work for you if you want to be a good PM, but it doesn't work if you want to be a great PM. That's because you need to be quite versatile as a great PM. You need to be able to change your approach depending on the situation you're presented with. You have to know when to stop using your superpower and rely on other skills instead. To illustrate that, let me share another framework with you. And this is the perennial debate of product management. And it asks the question, is product management an art, which is represented by the activities and preferences on the left? Or is it a science which is represented by the activities and preferences to the right? And depending on who you ask and their own strengths as a product manager, people will pick a point on the green line and say, this is exactly where product management should be. No doubts whatsoever. Now, here's my answer to this question. If you want to be really great, you should be able to operate at all points on the green line. And that's because being versatile gives you more op optionality on what company to work for. You don't want to be pigeonholed uh, as just an early stage PM, which will require you to veer more towards the art side, or just a late stage PM, which will require you to veer more towards the science side. That's why in the good PM, great PM thread, I wrote about how great PMs understand that users are driven by emotion. They don't just rely on a purely logical view of the world in order to conceive products, great PMs. And similarly, why great PMs aren't driven by data. Being metrics driven isn't a quality that should be lauded. 
Great PMs are informed by data and they masterfully blend qualitative and quantitative inputs to make product decisions. I believe this versatility is tremendously important because it can help you pick companies that you want to work at on your own terms based on what's important to you. Which brings me to the last, last part of my talk, which is uh, picking the right places to do the job. As you get more talented as a PM, where are you going to take your talents? In this section, I'll share my perspective on the main factors to consider when joining a, a company as a PM. Now, first we need to recognize that companies are made of people. And just like people, companies can have biases and they do have biases. You can have a customer first company like Amazon famously is or a tech first company like Google had been for a while, uh, or a design first company, perhaps Apple comes to mind there, or even a competition first company, which is what uh, Yahoo was around 2007, 2008, uh, obsessed with Google as their nemesis. So as a PM, uh, what type of company should you pick? Often PMs tell me they want to work at a at PM driven companies, companies where product management is the most important function. And therefore product management has the maximum say in what gets done. Now, I think PM driven companies are bad places for the best PMs to work at. There are a number of reasons for it, but the main one is depicted in this slide. And that is that PM driven companies will almost always produce really mediocre products. So if you care about building products, it's never going to be fun for you to work at PM driven companies. So my advice for people is to work at product first companies. Why? Because number one at product first companies, the biggest leverage comes from the product itself. When that is the case, you have no choice, but to build the best products that you can. It's just too critical for the business. Number two, in order to build a super product, you need all the functions to be bought in. I don't care how great you are as a PM, there is no way you can consistently build super products if other functions such as engineering, design, data science are not as passionate as you about building the right products in the right way. Number three, these companies don't just think about the pixels on the screen as the product. They think about the entire customer experience as the product. And this last point is something I learned at Stripe. At Stripe, we have the main product, which is our API and our dashboard. Uh, but after I joined Stripe, I noticed the attention to detail to the other parts of our customer's experience. The documentation, the website, the customer support process, even our blog posts took significantly more time and iteration than I was used to at other companies. And as I started seeing the benefits of this approach, I began applying it to my team's work as well. For instance, anytime a new PM joined my team, I would remind them that as a product geared towards developers, our docs, our documentation is the product. And I'd repeat it as much as I could. The docs are the product, the docs are the product, the docs are the product. So people knew that I'd review our docs with the same fine tooth comb as I would review our user onboarding flow. Zooming out, and this is my last story. And my last story is about how I came to join Stripe and why I've stayed at Stripe longer than almost every company I've worked for. And it's about the people. When I was ready to move on from Twitter, I embarked on a systematic job search across many dozens of companies. At the end of that search process, I had a number of great offers. Uh, and of the five or six that I was considering seriously, Stripe was really the odd one out. Each of the other offers was for a VP product role at a fast growth startup. Stripe was an individual con contributor position. So I would not be managing any people there. And Stripe was only beginning at the time to hire product managers after many years of stating publicly that it did not need to hire product managers. Uh, plus, in my previous role at Twitter, I was working on a portfolio of products 
fanning out to hundreds of engineers. At Stripe, I'd begin working with a team of just four engineers. And yet, it was not easy for me to discard Stripe from my list, despite having some great options elsewhere. Like all true PMs, I had my spreadsheet with pros and cons, expected value of the stock I was getting, and so on. But the spreadsheet did not help me decide. I was extremely torn at the time and decided to get advice from a few people I trusted. And I distinctly remember what one of them said when I told them that I especially like three of these companies and I'm not sure which one to pick. And this person told me uh, that I should visualize working at each of these three companies, like take some time to visualize what it will be like to work at these three companies. Very vividly imagine what it would be like to solve a product problem on a whiteboard with the people I met at each of these companies during the interview process. Take an hour to visualize every detail at the, and at the end of it, see how I feel. So I did that one weekend. And uh, at the end of this visualization exercise, the answer was obvious. While each of these companies was great, uh, Stripe was just head and shoulders above them in terms of how this visualization made me feel. And that was because of the caliber of people I had met during the interview process. So then and there, I decided to go with Stripe despite all the risks. And you know how uh, after you join a company uh, that you're very excited about, uh, it's always a little bit of a letdown. The company is still good, but it's just not as good as you had imagined. At Stripe, about one month in, I had the exact opposite feeling. Uh, Stripe exceeded my already high expectations. Uh, in about one month. And uh, the caliber of people was just stunningly consistent. And I'm not just talking about smart people. For me, what drew me to Stripe was, uh, and what has kept me here, is that the people at Stripe are smart, energetic, and nice. And if you're curious to learn more about this, we can cover it during the Q&A. But uh, really, this experience was pivotal for me in terms of... Uh, understanding that we can intellectualize all we want about titles and scope and domain and products and company size and so on. But at the end of the day, at least for me, uh, people matter the most. My happiness with my work is very directly related to the people I'm working with. And so it's true. Uh, ultimately, it's all about the people you work with. So to wrap up, my overall message for you is simple. Cultivate high agency, love the PM craft, and find your tribe. Find great people to work with throughout your career. And if you do this, I'm pretty sure success will follow. Thanks for giving me your time today, and I wish you all the very best in your PM journey. And we can now do Q&A. So, uh, thanks so much, Reyes. I think that was super insightful in the 30 to 40 minutes that uh, you could cover uh, the entire slides with him. Uh, Path, I've unmuted you, so you can take yeah. over. So, uh, I guess, uh, guys, I think the YouTube live had a small hiccup today, but don't worry. I think you guys can tell your friends that the recording would be available later. Uh, coming to the questions, I think we have a bunch of questions coming on Slido. We help us prioritize there, maybe go there, slido dot uh, slash stress, where we can ask the right questions. Uh, coming to the top few ones, uh, Shreyas, uh, we are very much aware of your 10, 30, 50 framework for, you know, uh, progressing in a PM career path. Uh, so it has been a time, it has been some time, you know, where we first heard that uh, slide or, you know, the recording. So just wanted to understand how has that evolved for you? And are there any key additions to that lately, which, you know, you have figured out in the recent time? Sure. Uh, let me share my, yeah. uh, my latest thinking around um, sort of the frameworks for PM growth. Right. And uh, let's see. All right. Um, so, uh, I tweeted about this a uh, few weeks ago as well. Uh, but uh, what I set out to do is create um, a, a more comprehensive 
product management career skills map. Uh, and uh, just to remind folks who are not familiar, or if people have forgotten, or folks who are not familiar with it, the 10, 30, 50 p.m. concept is that uh, uh, what you should aim to do is become top 10% in one of the senses, which is product sense, execution sense, analytical sense, top 30% in um, the other, and top 50% in the third. And if you can do that, you will create tremendous career optionality for yourself. Um, and so, so that's great. And that likely is a five to eight year journey uh, on average uh, for people uh, to embark on. But what about after that? And so what you see here is uh, the evolution of that framework, which is here I've plotted uh, the, the essential skills in product management throughout your career, no matter how long it is. And you still have analytical sense, product sense, execution sense as the foundation. You also have influential communication and critical thinking as the key pillars, which is if those pillars don't exist, the whole thing falls down. Uh, so they are super important as well. And then you build on that foundation within those pillars um, as you scale uh, higher levels of responsibility. Uh, so uh, over here, what you see is, you know, uh, starting from senior PM to when you become a group PM or a PM director, now you have to really emphasize your product vision and your strate strategic sense, your PM management sense, commercial sense, uh, ability to mentor people and so on. Uh, and so... So I would say that's really the evolution of, uh, uh, of uh, these skills. And there are a few other uh, things I could share, which is uh, over here. Uh, and again, you'll find this in the Twitter thread. Uh, I've also broken down because a lot of people ask me, uh, well, what does it mean though? Like, how do I improve my product sense? What do I need to do concretely? How do I become a better PM manager or a mentor? Uh, how do I uh, get better at critical thinking? Uh, and uh, the approach that has worked well for me is to break each of these concepts down into the component skills. And then one by one, work on those component skills. So for instance, product sense is uh, comprised of three elements, which is empathy, domain knowledge, and creativity. So if you want to improve your product sense, these are the three things you need to improve, just as an example. Uh, yeah, I think uh, that's a great skills map, Shreyas, and uh, love the thread on that as well. Looking forward to your thoughts on that. But um, picking off from right there, I think a lot of times um, we've seen the Twitter threads that you've written are shared across WhatsApp groups, shared across, and um, I think those are really, really insightful. So a um, bunch of questions around this. Do you have any framework for writing such high quality you know, thoughts? How do you pen them? Do you have some frameworks there? And what does Twitter really mean to you? What role does it play in your personal slash professional life? Um, yeah, so uh, my writing sort of summarizes things that I have been uh, uh, talking about over the past six to eight years uh, in my mentorship conversations with people I manage and so on. And so there's just a lot of pent up content uh, that I have to write. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm still working on becoming a better writer. Uh, so I don't think I'm qualified to really share, uh, you know, definitive frameworks, but I'm happy to share some things I do. Yep. So first of all, uh, the quarantine has been very helpful uh, for me in terms of writing. Uh, and so because uh, I've been stuck more at home, particularly, uh, I still have a very busy job. But what I do is I use the time I would normally use for commuting, which for me is about an hour, hour and a half. Uh, I use that time uh, to write um, yeah. every day. Uh, what you see on Twitter is about half of what I post. Uh, and so there is surely some really bad quality content that you don't even see, right? Uh, so there's that, which is, uh, there, there's some things I uh, get really excited about. Uh, and I think is great writing that I don't post because once I've written it, I also think through, the ways it can be helpful, but also ways it might hurt without context. 
the, a lot of that writing I don't actually end up posting because you can't really convey that nuance on Twitter. Uh, so that's another thing. Uh, and then, of course, somebody uh, told me that, uh, you know, it's great to uh, write for yourself. So I do write for myself. Um, so as did you want to say something there? No, I was just I was just coming to that, like you know, coming to the part where how has Twitter really like you've been active for some time now, and um, you know it's great for us as viewers to get that content. But how is it? To, how do you look at Twitter so that for everyone else out there? Yeah, um, look uh, from my perspective, uh, Twitter has been a life changing tool. I joined Twitter very early on, and I've, yep. I've, I've been on Twitter for a while. Uh, uh, one of the reason I joined Twitter, the company was because I wanted to work on the product that has had the most profound impact on my life. Uh, and so, uh, and that was a great experience. Um, and uh, the reason uh, I get gravitated towards Twitter is uh, mainly I'm optimizing for distribution. Okay. So I'm not optimizing for a personal brand. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just, I don't need to optimize for personal brand at the stage I'm at. So that's why I don't have my own like domain and blog where I post this content. Uh, and Twitter gives tremendous distribution. So that's one reason. Second, Twitter is a great forcing function to make my thoughts succinct. Uh, right. And, uh, you know, I like you know, people have asked me, how long does it take you to write these things? Actually, it doesn't take me very long. It's like the classic, it took me 15 years to learn it and only yeah. 10 minutes to write it. Uh, but uh, it like sometimes some threads take me an hour, even if, even if they're short, because I spend the remaining 30, 40 minutes making the thing fit within 280 characters, right? Uh, and yeah. as frustrating as it is, it's actually great because then I'm able to really distill the thing to its essence, I hope. Uh, and, and some people have told me that that's what's resonated for them. Right, absolutely. Yeah, I think I agree with that. Absolutely. Right. So uh, moving on, uh, Shreyasi explained that, you know, uh, your decision to reach, uh, to join Stripe eventually, which is basically pre-hoc, but we would want, like to know more about the post-hoc, you know, uh, how was it different than working with a company like Google? How, was the, how were the early stages of uh, Stripe for you? in context of product management? Yeah, um, so uh, I joined uh, Stripe. Um, actually, I'm gonna share my screen again because I do have a framework for that, which I did not include in the main presentation. Uh, let's do this. And, uh, so I joined Stripe uh, in, um, what I wanna say is the, um, um, stage one uh, of product management at any company. And just to zoom out, I believe there are four stages of product management at Silicon Valley companies. There's stage zero, which is, uh, there's no PM. Uh, it's very early stage. Uh, basically everybody does the PM job or the founders do the PM job. So we don't need somebody with an official PM title to do the job. So that's stage zero. Stage one is uh, when the company has grown enough and they say, you know what, like we've heard about this PM thing, let's give it a shot. But it's the do no harm stage, which is we have a great thing going. Let's just not mess it up with bringing PMs, right? So Stripe was at that stage uh, when I joined the company uh, and it was willing to try out PMs, but wasn't yet sure about what product management meant. Um, and so my goal became uh, to uh, transition Stripe, to recognize, first of all, that Stripe is indeed in this stage one, but then second, to transition Stripe to the next stage, which is stage two, which is uh, PM as leverage. So that's the, the best sort of time uh, to be a PM at a company, which is where the company understands that product management has significant leverage, uh, but at the same time, all other functions are sort of like equally involved in uh, building the product, in conceiving the product, in growing the product. Um, so, and so when I joined Google, for instance, in 2008, uh, Google was in stage two at the time. Um, there is this third stage, which is stage three. And it's a stage I hope uh, Stripe doesn't reach for as long as I work here. Uh, and uh, I have been in that stage at other companies, most notably at Yahoo. 
uh, where uh, PMs have taken over. Like PMs are running the show and effectively everybody is working for product management. Uh, and that's when I mentioned that was when the company becomes PM driven uh, and, uh, and the quality suffers and so on. So, so that's a framework uh, that uh, I found super useful in helping people understand uh, what um, state Stripe was at, uh, as well as um, sort of, uh, you know, what I wanted to do uh, as one of the goals when I joined Stripe. Now, concretely, another way that it was different was uh, uh, just the, uh, you know, Stripe had hired a lot of uh, uh, founders uh, very early on as employees. And so, uh, so the sense of ownership, the sense of high agency, uh, and the sense of uh, obsession with the product uh, was uh, just stunning uh, for me. Uh, and so, so that was uh, another difference. Uh, and, and the third difference was the speed of our decisions. Now, Google was also quite fast uh, in terms of uh, execution, especially during the earlier days that I was there. Uh, but uh, Stripe was another level altogether. Uh, so for instance, we would, uh, uh, especially in the earlier days, we would just... Uh, see a problem, we would discuss the problem, we would make the decision, uh, and then we would uh, uh, you know, start working uh, towards that decision on implementing it, all within a span of a few minutes or hours. Uh, and uh, as any of you who have worked at larger companies, it's harder to do. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Shriyash, the next question is around PM hiring, I think you covered a lot of it in the slide and the skills map that you shared earlier. But um, is there is there any um, anything common that you see across the four organizations that we spoke about in detail? So are there any like top PM skills that are like a deal ba- deal breaker for you? Say so you have you know in that hiring, or do you see like you know hiring PM hiring at Stripe very different from Google versus Yahoo? So when you are at the other side of the table, how does it look and anything that, you know, will be valuable for the rest of us here. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, certainly every company is a little different um, mm-hmm. in terms of what it looks for. The main thing uh, I'll talk about my own uh, perspective and my preferences uh, yeah. when I'm looking to hire somebody on my team you know, or a team that I'm going to be working closely with. And basically there are three things that for me are uh, very important. So first one, and it should come at, as no surprise whatsoever, is high agency. It's really important for me. Second is uh, for most roles, especially true at Stripe, where we are working on earlier stage products at earlier stage company, uh, product sense is extremely important uh, for me. Uh, and again, product sense is the ability to usually make the right product decisions, both macro and micro, uh, even in the presence of major ambiguity, right? And again, earlier stage products and earlier stage companies are filled with ambiguity. And so you need somebody who is uh, like, I I think at Amazon, they say, uh, um, you know, who's right very often and product sense is uh, the fuel for that. So for me, product sense is really important as well. And uh, the third one for me uh, is a trait. Uh, which is uh, the lack of a major ego. And particularly uh, uh, for me, a red flag with a candidate is if I feel like this candidate is going to put themselves before the company or put their own uh, growth and own agenda before uh, the team. Uh, So for me, that is a non-negotiable. And if I see that uh, in a candidate, then it's going to be a no. So again, just to recap, there are many factors, of course, right, for but sure. these three uh, high agency product sense and, um, you know, this kind of sense of ownership, lack of a big ego uh, is really important. Fair enough. Uh, Shreya, just one follow up there. Um, one question that um, we often get on the handle or, you know, sometimes when we put out a post saying what are some challenges that PMs face? One thing a lot of people ask is credentials. You know, sometimes it might be an MBA background. Sometimes it might be a tech heavy background. So have you come across situations because in your case, I think it was very organic and you shared a nice framework over your 15 years, but in recent times, um, do you see that as a, as a 
as a necessity. I wouldn't say necessity, but do you see that as an advantage for someone who when wants you, to look? When you say that, do you mean an MBA or credentials? An MBA. Yeah, any kind of credential in terms of, uh, yeah, MBA is one thing that comes out often sometimes. Um, yeah, we could start yeah. with an MBA to be a credential. Yeah. Yeah. And look, there now, uh, you know, 15 years ago, like I said, I searched very hard and I found one class on product management in Silicon Valley. And I bet right. like many other parts of the world did not have anything. Right. Uh, it's very different now, right? Like there's just perhaps too much material. There's so many schools exactly. dedicated to product management. Uh, I believe you can even get a degree at this point in product management at some Correct. places. Correct. So, and then there's the MBA uh, path as well. So um, here's my perspective. Um, one is that, uh, you know, it's fine for somebody to get their MBA uh, in order to get into product management. I don't think that is wrong. I think what you should understand is what will that MBA get you? And uh, there was a talk I did 10 years ago about getting into product management where I talked about uh, an MBA degree is a doorknob. It is not an escalator. Right. So what I meant by that is an MBA degree will get you in the room. It will get you through the door. It will get you your first interview. Right. An MBA degree, as far as it pertains to product management, is not going to guarantee uh, that you become a great PM or that you have a very flourishing, fulfilling PM career. Right. So it is important to understand that uh, because I I feel when I talk to people, some of them say, well, like, you know, I see all these great PMs with great careers and all of them have gone to Stanford for their MBA. So I should do that as well. Well, what you don't see is there are many people who've done their Stanford MBAs, but like their careers haven't gone anywhere in terms of, uh, you know, product management particularly. So what you're seeing is it's classic selection bias there or survivorship bias. So, so you have to be aware of that, right? So, so that's one point about credentials. But other than that, like do what helps, right? Like, so if, if, if it helps you to get more structure uh, and to go through a program for product management, absolutely do that, but do not use it as a crutch. Like you have to invest your own time outside of any force forcing functions, like a class you have to take in order to get really good at the job. Uh, yeah, thanks for sharing great, that. Great, I think. Great. So, uh, yeah, moving on, Shres. Uh, so we have a lot of uh, senior folks also have joined us and this probably is question, this question is probably more related to them. So you coach a lot of PMs within your company or maybe outside, outside as well. So uh, any anecdotes that you want to share or key learnings that has changed the game for you in context of coaching other PMs? Yes. Uh, so I was not very good at coaching. Um, and, um, uh, uh, you know, one thing I did not mention is uh, in my stories, um, uh, after I joined Yahoo, within 10 months, uh, I was uh, promoted to be a manager. So I'm 10 months into my first real job as a PM. And now uh, I started managing, started with one individual. Uh, and looking back, I was a terrible manager and I was a terrible coach because I did make the classic rookie ma manager mistake, which is I thought my job was to provide answers and ideas, right? Uh, it's only much later in my career um, and in my evolution as a leader that I realized that the most important thing uh, is to be asking the right questions. Uh, and again, this is something I've tweeted about in the past about like the power of questions but when I discovered the power of questions uh, in my coaching, uh, that I, I think made a substantial difference, I think, in uh, the quality uh, of my coaching. Um, and the other thing I'll mention is uh, uh, listening skills. And I know it's a cliche to talk about listening skills, like, oh, give me something more advanced. But really, there is nothing, there is no like secret advanced recipe to get better at managing people and becoming a leader. Uh, it is the basics. And the problem is that the basics are really hard. Uh, and so for me, uh, listening was really important uh, uh, as a skill. And I, like, I, I worked on it for a couple of years very intently. Uh, and uh, once I got good at listening, like really good at listening, night and day difference in my ability to coach people. So I would, I would call those two things out, which were just basically things I worked on uh, in order to uh, sort of like, help coach people better. 
Very interesting. Um, Shreyas, I think we've, we've been discussing a lot about the 15 years you spent and some learnings from there. So a um, couple of questions around your thoughts, because technology is moving super fast now. What are your thoughts on how this product management is today versus maybe in the coming years, you know, any thoughts on how things have changed and, you know, how you're probably, you know, dealing with it. Maybe it could be for the learning side, it could be general thoughts, but future of product management or evolution of product management. Yeah, uh, um, I think product management has uh, in some ways arrived, you know, even 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and certainly before that product management wasn't a, people did not understand it. I think at this point in most organizations, people understand product management. Um, It's still not to the degree that they might understand engineering or design or other functions. I don't know if we'll ever reach that level of understanding. Uh, which is why I also talk a lot about product management uh, in my writing uh, as just a field and what it is for and so on. Uh, But uh, I think we're in a much better place uh, than uh, we have been. So there's been definitely a lot of positive evolution in terms of understanding uh, the importance of product management as well, Uh, which will then mean that there's going to be more and more opportunities uh, for product managers at product companies, because ultimately, and this is something I tweeted, I think yesterday, uh, you know, uh, to be successful, uh, a product company needs to be good at uh, what product to build, how to build it, and how to get adoption for it. Okay. That makes sense. I mean, that's just like, I'm stating the obvious, right? No new insight there. The important part is that product management is the only function within the company that is deeply involved in each of these three, right? Um, and, uh, and perhaps owns the first, but is also involved very deeply in second and third, right? And you take engineering and they're kind of involved in the first and the second, but not the third as much, right? So, uh, so given that product management is so deeply involved in each of these three things. And given that these three things are essentially going to determine how much a company succeeds, uh, it therefore follows that product management uh, can be highly impactful, right? And what is perhaps giving product management a bad name is the cases of bad product management, right? And that's like my goal and my differentiation in my writing is to try to steer people away from that essentially. Uh, and so, uh, so that, those are my key observations. Now, looking forward, I'll make one bold prediction. And there's a, I want to say a 50% chance I'll be wrong about this, but I'll make it anyway, which is uh, uh, likely in the valley, I'm seeing this trend towards product management reaching a ceiling uh, in terms of your growth within the organization. Uh, what I'm seeing more and more of is that uh, there's going to be this shift towards complete ownership. There's going to be shift towards a GM model more and more. So what that will mean is it'll still mean that you need product managers to work on individual products, but uh, especially at mid-size and large-size companies uh, within the next 10 years, I expect that the very senior roles are going to go away. Uh, The pure product management senior roles are going to go away like VP of product. Uh, And they're going to be replaced by these GM or CPO type roles where uh, the individual is managing both engineering teams and product teams. So that's what I predict for the Valley. Uh, (laughs) And so it's still a good place to be as a product manager. Uh, But if you really want to be like, you know, if you want to scale the highest levels of a mid-size to a large company, I predict uh, that you will need to uh, develop in addition to the normal skills of product management, You'll need to develop the ability to um, manage engineering teams as well uh, if you want to scale those levels. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, that's great. Uh, moving on. Uh, so you, we have read multiple threads about, you know, you're recommending product strategy and everything, but uh, the books around product strategy, but uh, the kind of audience that we have, you know, aspiring PMs or PMs or mid, mid-level PMs, uh, what are the top three, two or three books that you would recommend them to read? that are, you know, your go-to books too. Uh, you mean just for product strategy or overall? No, 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 for overall, product just product management, yeah. yeah. So product strategies, um, you, are, you are extremely interested in product strategy, strategy in general, yeah. but overall yeah. in product management, what would you recommend? Yeah, uh, I would recommend 
yeah, let's let's stick with three. There are a lot of books and like, look, I have read hundreds of books and they've all like in some ways been very helpful. But if I were to recommend three, it would be first uh, inspired by Marty Kagan. Uh, and the reason I recommend that is because that will help you understand what real product management is. And so it'll help you understand the craft. Okay. And I think it's very necessary for, especially for earlier to uh, mid-stage PMs to really understand the craft. Uh, so that's for the PM craft. The second book uh, that I would uh, recommend here is, um, is going to be about uh, the observation that uh, PMs don't reach their potential because uh, they cannot manage usually their own psychology and themselves as well as they should. So it's not because they lacked some knowledge uh, about how to do proper product management. Uh, it's, it's more about the traits uh, and the, the behaviors, uh, what holds back uh, really talented PMs. Uh, and so uh, my recommendation there would be to read The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. There are other books as well. And again, it can be a cliche to say, oh yeah, seven habits. I read it when I was 21. No, really actually read it carefully. Read it twice, read it three times, right? Because a lot of the seven habits, if it is my contention that the seven habits of effect, uh, highly effective people, uh, you know, be proactive, think win-win, et cetera, et cetera, are identical to the seven habits of highly effective PMs. Um, and so, so really I, I cannot emphasize enough um, uh, like how important it is to actually really truly understand what he's trying to say in that book. So that's the second. Uh, and the third one uh, I'd recommend is around uh, rigorous thinking uh, and critical thinking. Uh, and so that is really important as well, of course, uh, for PMs. And uh, I think the best book there is uh, the book called Super Thinking by Gabriel Weinberg and Lauren McCann. Uh, and so to round out my top three recommendations, that would be my third recommendation because it'll help you really make much better decisions if you internalize the frameworks and the mental models in that book. Awesome, awesome. Um, Path, how much uh, time, how many questions do you think we could take? Or... Maybe uh, two or three quick questions. Uh, I think the audience is still there. Uh, so we are we're there just going to like, take like five minutes more. And get, yeah. yeah. Sure. Perfect. So, um, yeah, I think a um, couple of interesting ones. Let me pick the ones that are right on top. I think um, there's one. Um, yeah, so I'll club these. Um, more more on the more on the lines of the day in the life of a pm so you were one of the first pms at stripe what are the best parts of working at yahoo google and twitter it could be your culture it could be the processes what are some interesting things that you picked off from there that helped you at your role at stripe is there anything significant hmm. um look at the common theme across each of these companies has been just, I have learned so much from other people. Um, and uh, the, I was lucky in that I had this inborn tendency to look at any situation. And uh, besides just dealing with the situation, whatever it is, some prioritization issue or some product issue, customer issue, besides just, like looking at the situation, uh, somehow I was built in a way that I, 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 I just default step back and said, oh, this is an interesting situation. What can I learn from it? Right, like at a meta level. Um, and so I became, uh, because of this, I became a keen observer of organizations and how they function. And you can see some of those observations in my writing because like I'm very, like again, observational uh, about organizations. Uh, um, and so, so, so because of that, I learned a lot of things uh, at each of these companies around how to operate, right? How to lead, uh, how to make decisions, how not to make decisions, right? At, at each of these companies, um, like there were these common themes. Now, those were the common themes across these companies. Uh, if we were to get specific, uh, I think Google taught me uh, how to work really well with engineers. Uh, it also taught me uh, how to, uh, how to just like be a lot more ambitious, 
uh, about what you can do because Google was just oozing with ambition uh, in those days. Uh, and so, uh, I, and I think like that is one skill. People ask me like, should I join Google or should I join whatever the next Google is? Uh, and I, I say like, look, uh, it might be worth joining some of these companies merely because it will just broaden your view of how ambitious one can be, right? So for me, Google ambition was huge. Uh, for me, Twitter, uh, like the key thing I learned is the importance of emotion, both in terms of understanding people's emotions, uh, users' emotions, but also just like, putting emotion into the work, right? Like is very important. And so that's another thing I learned at Twitter. Yahoo was formative for me. Like I pretty much learned everything about product management uh, that uh, like I, I would have wished for over there. So uh, certainly like I took all of those learnings and applied them at Stripe in one way or another. But then uh, I learned a bunch of stuff at Stripe as well, still learning. Yeah. That's it. So uh, moving on to the last few questions, just non product management for a while now. So uh, what would you do if not product management? Is there any other career path that has interested you or, you know, you'd want, you would have pursued? Mm, um, with the, with the caveat that uh, I think I was born to be a product manager. So it's, <laughs> that, it's, that's top I, one, I, yeah. maybe, maybe like, I, I don't know, I might be unemployed. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I mean, certainly I could have been an engineer, but I, like I said, I, I wasn't a great engineer. So, um, um, so there's that, um, you know, for a while I wanted to start a company. I don't anymore, uh, but for a decade, decade and a half, I thought that that's what I was going to do. And so perhaps if I had not done a product management, which gave me my fix, because I'm always like, uh, my, my mindset is very entrepreneurial, uh, even if I'm working for another company. So, but if I hadn't gotten my entrepreneurial fix through product management, I would have channeled it into starting a company perhaps. That's awesome. That's awesome. Hoping yeah. that might come true sometime in the future. You never know. <laughs> yep. So, um, Pat, I think um, probably the last question. Um, and she has any closing thoughts that you might have, but this is one of my favorite parts. It's called, uh, if you knew it then, what would you do now? So any uh, any learnings that you see if, if there were three things that you'd like to tell younger Shreyas maybe 10 years back or 15 years back what would those be? Hmm. Um, it could be general not related yeah. to the product but yeah. uh, make career transition decisions much more intentionally uh, I made some mistakes uh early on in my career about what companies to join and when to join them. And uh, I, I try not to think about those mistakes because they cost me a lot of money, let's just say, uh, but it's fine. Like I ended up doing fine anyway, so it's okay. But, uh, but I think I just wasn't as, um, as intentional and uh, thoughtful about uh, which companies to join uh, early on. Uh, and and uh, so that's, so that's one. Um, second one would be, uh, around, uh, yeah, I would emphasize listening as another one. Um, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a skill I learned later in life. I, I wish I had developed like that really authentic, concentrated listening skill much earlier on in my career. Uh, and uh, the third one is uh, I used to be a nervous wreck early on in my PM career because I was very ambitious. I wanted to get a lot of things done. I took on a lot of scope and work and I wanted to do a fabulous job. And so what that did is I was just stressed, um, you know, for the first, I want to say six years of my PM career, I was extremely stressed. Uh, and so what I would tell that younger self is um, uh, to learn how to manage your stress better uh, through physical activity, mental practice and all of that. Uh, but most importantly, don't take, take things so seriously because, uh, Work is important, but it's not that important. Well, I think thanks so much. I think lots for us to think about. And hopefully in your coming Twitter threads, we'll get to read more about these learnings as well. And yeah, with that, I think um, we had an amazing time hosting you, Shreyas, and I hope you uh, also enjoyed the questions and interacting with our community. So thanks once again from all of us here at TPF and all of us who joined today. Um, 
we'd we'd uh, we definitely encourage everyone here to you know stay connected to Shreya. His his thoughts have been super helpful for me personally for Path, and we'd love to see you Shreya in a round two sometime, and we'd love to host you sometime in the future as well. So thank you so much once again for joining us and wishing you the very best. Thank you. This was a blast, and thanks for having me. And uh, look f- looking forward to feedback and looking forward to continuing the discussion on Twitter and elsewhere. Absolutely, absolutely. And to everyone who joined in today, uh, I think sure you can see the chat section. I think everyone loved it as well. Thank you so much, guys. I know it's a late Sunday evening in India, so hope you guys had fun. And this was great. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we have another new initiative called the uh, 100 PM, where we want to highlight uh, great community guys who are, you know, helping build the ecosystem, have built great things and helping us learn. So Apartha shared a link here. It's called Nominations for 100 PM. So anyone who's inspired you, anyone who you think, you know, it could be your mentors, it could be people who you follow, but help us cultivate this ecosystem and let's give them a shout out together. So yeah, Shreyas could be one of them as well. So if you guys have learned, do definitely definitely nominate him and yes i think thank you so much once again for joining us guys and see you in the next edition thank you everyone have a great week yep thanks Thanks so much see you guys Bye. bye